from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Headless Cat The following case of an animal haunting was related to me by Mr. Robert Dane of Cheshire, who was at one time the tenant of a house in the Stratford Road, Manchester. When we, my wife and I, took the house, no possibility of the place being haunted crossed our minds. Indeed, ghosts were the very last things we reckoned on, as neither of us had the slightest belief in them. Like most solicitors I am, I believe a practical man, while my wife is the most matter-of-fact woman you would meet in a day's march. Nor was there anything unusual or suggestive about the house. It was airy and light, no dark corners or gloomy staircases, and equipped throughout with all modern conveniences. We began our lease in June, the hottest June I remember, and nothing occurred to disturb us till October. I will quote from my diary. Monday, October 11th. Brian, my brother-in-law, and I, at 11 p.m., were sitting smoking and chatting together in the study. All the rest of the household had gone to bed. We had no light in the room, as Brian had a headache, save the fire, and that had burned so low that its feeble glimmering scarcely enabled us to see each other's face. After we had sat in thoughtful silence for a time, Brian took the stump of a cigar from his lips and threw it in the grate where for a few moments it lay glowing in the gloom. Robert, he said, you will think me mad, but there is something very queer about this room tonight, something in the atmosphere I can't explain, but which I have never felt here or anywhere before. Look at the cigar end, look. I did so and received a shock. What I saw was certainly not the stump Brian had had in his mouth, but an eye, a large red and lurid eye that looked up at us with an expression of the utmost hate. Brian raised the shovel and struck at it, but without effect. It still glared at us. A great horror then seized us, and unable to remove our gaze from the hellish thing, we sat glued to our chairs staring at it. This state of affairs lasted till the clock in the hall outside struck twelve, when the eyes suddenly vanished and we both felt as if some intensely evil influence had been suddenly removed. Brian did not like the idea of sleeping alone and asked if he might keep the electric light on in his room all night. Tremendous extravagance, but under the circumstances, excusable. Tuesday, October 12th. I was awakened at 11.30 p.m. by my Phyllis, my wife, saying to me, Oh, Robert, there have been such dreadful noises on the landing just as if a cat were being worried to death by dogs. Listen, there it is again. And as she spoke from apparently just outside the door came a series of loud screeches accompanied by savage growls and snarls. Not knowing what to make of it, as we had no animals of our own in the house, but concluding that a door or window having been left open, a door and cat had got in from outside, I lit a candle and opened the bedroom door. Instantly the sound ceased and there was dead silence, and although I searched everywhere, not a sign of any animal was to be seen. Moreover, all the doors leading to the garden were shut and locked, and the windows closed. Not wishing to frighten Phyllis, I laughingly assured her that the cat she had heard was all right, and sitting on the roof of the summer house, looking none the worse for its treatment, and that I had sent a dog flying out of the gate with a well-deserved kick. I explained it was all my fault, leaving a door open, and asked her on no account to blame the servants. It seemed a very neat line, certainly dispelled her worries. Friday, October 22nd. On my way to bed last night, I encountered a rush of icy cold air at the first bend of the staircase. 
The candle flared up a bright blue flame and went out. Something, an animal of sorts, came tearing down the stairs past me, and on peering over the banisters, I saw, looking up at me, from the wall of a darkness beneath, two big red eyes, the counterparts of the one Brian and I had seen on October 11th. I threw a matchbox at them, but without effect. It was only when I switched on the electric light that they disappeared. I searched the house most carefully, but there was no sign of any animal. I said nothing to Phyllis. Monday, November 8th. Thomas and Mabel came running into Phyllis's room in a great state of excitement after tea today. Mother, they cried, Mother, do come. Some hard dog has got a cat in the spare room and is tearing it to pieces. Phyllis, who was mending my socks at the time, jumped to her feet and flew to the spare room. The door of the room was shut, but proceeding from within was the most appalling pandemonium of screeches and snarls, just as if some dog had got hold of a cat by the neck and was shaking it to death. Phyllis swung open the door and rushed in. The room was empty, not a trace of a cat or dog anywhere, and the sound ceased. On my return home, Phyllis met me in the garden. Robert, she said, I have probed the mystery at last. The house is haunted. We must leave. Saturday, November 13th. Sublet house to Mr. James Barstow, retired oil merchant today. He comes in on the 30th. Hope he'll like it. Tuesday, November 16th. Cook left today. I've no fault to find with you, Mum. She took pains to explain to Phyllis, it's not you nor the children, nor the food. It's the noises at night, screeches outside my door, which sound like a cat, but which I know can't be a cat, as there is no cat in the house. This morning, Mum, shortly after the clock struck two, hearing something in the corner and wondering if it was a mouse, I sat up in bed and was getting ready to strike a light. The matchbox was in my hand when something heavy sprang right on top of me and gave a low growl in my ear. That finished me, Mum. I fainted. When I come to myself, I was too frightened to stir, but lay with my head under the blankets till it was time to get up. I then searched everywhere, but there was no sign of any dog, and as the door was locked, there was no possibility of a dog having got in during the night. Mrs. Dane, I wouldn't go through what I suffered again for 50 pounds. I would rather go without my month's wages than sleep in that room another night. Phyllis paid her up to date, and she went directly after tea. Friday, November 19th. As I was coming out of the bathroom at 11 p.m., something fell into the bath with a loud splash. I turned to see what it was. There was nothing there. I ran up the stairs to bed, three steps at a time. Sunday, November 21st. Went to church in the morning as usual. On the way back, I was pondering over the sermon when Dot, she is six today, came running up to me very scared. Father, she cried, catching my sleeve, do hurry. Mother is very ill. Full of dreadful anticipations, I tore home, and on arriving found Phyllis lying on the couch in a violent fit of hysterics. It was fully an hour before she recovered sufficiently to tell me what had happened. This is what she then told me. After you went to church, I made the custard pudding, jelly, and blancmange for dinner, and had just sat down with the intention of writing a letter to mother when I heard a very pathetic meow coming, so I thought from under the couch. Thinking it was some stray cat that had got in through one of the windows, I tried to entice it out by calling to it. No cat coming out and the mewing still continuing. I knelt down and peered under the couch. There was no cat there. Had it been night, I would have been very much afraid, but I could scarcely reconcile myself to the idea of ghosts in a room bright with daylight. Resuming my seat, I went on with my writing, but not for long. The mewing grew nearer. I distinctly heard something crawl out from under the couch. There was then a pause, and then something sprang upon me and dug its claws in my knees. I looked down into my horror, saw standing on its hind legs, pawing my clothes, a large tabby cat without a head. The neck terminated 
in a mangled stump. The sight so appalled me that I don't know what happened, but nurse and the children came in and found me lying on the floor in hysterics. Robert, we must leave this house at once. Tuesday, November 30th. Left Stratford Road at 2 p.m. Had a great rush to get things packed in time and dread opening some of the packing cases, especially those with crockery. Just as we were starting, Phyllis cried out that she had left her reticule behind and I was sent to search for it. I looked everywhere without success and was leaving the premises in full anticipation of being sent back again when there was a loud commotion in the hall, just as if a dog had probably pounced on a cat. The next moment, a large tabby with a head hewn away as Phyllis had described rushed up to me and tried to spring onto my shoulders. At this juncture, one of the servants who had been sent to look for me opened the hall door and called out. The cat instantly vanished, and on my reaching Phyllis, she told me she had found her reticule, that she had been sitting on it all the time. In a subsequent note in his diary, a year or so later, Mr. Dane says, After innumerable inquiries about the history of the house in Stretford Road prior to our inhabiting, I have elicited the fact that 12 years ago Mr. and Mrs. Miller lived there. They had one young son whom they spoiled in the most outrageous fashion, even to the extent of encouraging him in acts of cruelty. To afford him amusement, he was allowed to buy rats for his dog to worry, and he on one occasion procured a stray cat, which the servants afterwards declared was mangled. In the most shocking manner before being finally destroyed by the boy. Here, in my opinion, is a very feasible explanation for the hauntings. For if human tragedies are reenacted by ghosts, why not animal tragedies too? Mr. Barstow, to whom we sublet, has now finished his term without reporting anything strange. We hope the next tenants of the house will be as fortunate as he. Hunting Ghosts in America when I worked on my way across the United States just before the turn of the century, a hard tour during which I tackled a variety of jobs from freelance journalist to cook on a ranch out west, it was unthinkable to many people back home in Britain that America, being so modern in its civilizations, should possess any ghosts at all. But ghosts there certainly were, and it began to fill my notebook almost as soon as I arrived. There was, for instance, a good deal of talk going on about a school at Newburyport, which was haunted by the phantom of a little boy with golden hair and dressed all in brown. The splendid of ghost was to be seen either peering through one of the windows with an expression of infinite sadness in its big dark eyes, or wandering disconsolately up and down the stairs. Pathetic and harmless though it would seem to have been, this poor little phantom had the most alarming effect on scholars, and as a consequence, the school rapidly lost pupils as they were abruptly taken away from it by their parents. Apparently, there was no known cause for the haunting. Another haunting, also testified to by a number of witnesses, concerned the driver of an engine on the Syracuse and Binghamton Railway. The driver suddenly became haunted by the phantom of a woman which, he said, stood by his side on the engine and tried to throw him onto the line. His mate on the engine used to see the driver engaged in a furious struggle with some, to him, invisible presence, and once this man heard a voice, unmistakably a woman, say to the driver with a chuckle, Now, Bill, I've got you, and I'll throw you into the water. The train was crossing a river bridge at the time. Finally, both men became so unnerved that they could not go on any longer and said that if they could not be transferred to another engine, they would quit. They were duly transferred and were not disturbed by any further hauntings. My informant regarding this curious case told me that the haunted engine was still in existence and that the last time he had seen it in one of the sheds of the Syracuse and Binghamton Railway, he was told that no one would venture near it at night especially because of the ghost, which would frequently be heard there talking and laughing. Another strange case involving a railway was still very much under discussion at this time. During the 70s, great excitement was caused in the railway depot at Newark 
by a real ghost train. Regularly at midnight, on the 10th of every month, a train was heard to rush to the depot at express speed. Nothing was ever to be seen, but all who came to experience the phenomena, and as many as 600 people were gathered together on one occasion in the depot, heard the screaming of an engine's whistle, accompanied by the rattle and clatter of wheels as the invisible train approached the station and rushed through. Typical of other recent hauntings was a house in Virginia haunted by the ghost of a human head with wide open glaring eyes. It peered in through the windows and looked down over the banisters on the landings always uttering one word only, blood. I wish I could have stayed and investigated more thoroughly some of these and other hauntings which were brought to my notice as I traveled across the country, but time and money did not allow. I was fortunate, though, to meet in San Francisco the captain of a trader who gave me the background to an extraordinary affair concerning a Norwegian vessel called the Squando, a case which must be unique in maritime history. I met Captain Harding at the International Hotel, and the matter-of-fact way of a sailor he told me the whole gruesome story, which was this. A few years previously, a shocking tragedy had occurred on board the bark Squando as she lay in San Francisco Harbor. A cry was heard coming from her one night, and in the morning the first mate was found to have vanished, and there was bloodstains on deck. The mate's decapitated body was afterwards found floating in the harbor. It transpired that the Squando's captain and his wife, for some reason or another, had conceived a strong antipathy to the first mate, and there had been endless quarrels and disputes. In the end, the captain and his wife had both attacked the unfortunate mate and murdered him. They first of all plied him with drink, and then, when he was too intoxicated to defend himself, the woman held his arms while her husband beheaded him with an axe. They then heaved the body overboard. Captain Harding told me he had met the murderers on several occasions before the crime, and he described the woman as being goodish-looking but with very hard eyes. He said he believed she and the mate had been carrying on together, and that when she feared they would be found out, she rounded on the mate and pretended to the husband that it was all the mate's fault, that he had in fact been persistently annoying her. Soon after this murder, Captain Harding told me the Squando witnessed another tragedy. While at sea, the crew mutinied and killed the new captain appointed in the murderer's place. The cause of the mutiny was never made very clear, but there was little doubt that originated over some heated words with the captain regarding some odd happenings on board which the crew attributed to the murder of the mate. After this second tragedy, the Squando acquired a sinister reputation, and this was heightened when her next captain was found dead in circumstances that could not be accounted for, and his successor also died in a very mysterious fashion. After this fourth death, the hauntings aboard proved too much for the crew, and on the Squando's arrival at Bathurst, New Brunswick, in the spring of 1893, Every man aboard her deserted. All efforts to obtain another crew failed, and the bark was obliged to lie idle until the rumor that she was haunted finally reached the ears of the Norwegian consul. He at once declared his intention of getting to the bottom of the mystery. With this in view, he hired two strong, hard-headed night watchmen and sent them on board to Squando one evening with instructions to hide themselves and lie in wait for and seize anyone they suspected of playing tricks. The two men rode out and boarded the ship about nine o'clock and began their vigil in the captain's cabin. For the first hour or so, nothing happened, and they were beginning to think the story of the vessel being haunted was all moonshine, when they suddenly heard the most extraordinary noises on deck. They ran for the companion ladder, and on scaling it found the deck in great disorder. When they had come on board, everything had been in its place. Now the deck was covered with a confused mass of ropes, bars, yards, hand spikes, and other equipment, but they saw nothing to account for the mess. Very puzzled, they went below deck again, and feeling tired, both lay down in the captain's bunk. They had not been long in it before they felt sharp tugs at their sleeves and trousers, yet when they sat up and looked around, no one was to be seen, but that was not all. The tugs were soon followed by far more unpleasant phenomena. Icy cold hands were laid on their faces, while the coats and rugs with which they had covered themselves were torn off and thrown on the floor. Getting up, they lit a lantern, 
but it was immediately blown out. And as they stood trembling, wondering what was going to happen next, a number of voices proceeding apparently from all parts of the cabin whispered in hollow, menacing tones, Go, go, at once. Convinced now that they were dealing with the supernatural, and that it would be exceedingly risky for them to remain aboard any longer, they left the cabin and were walking along the passage leading to the companion ladder when they heard a peculiar noise behind them. They turned and received a terrific shock. Coming after them with long strides from the direction of the cabin they had just quitted was a tall, grotesque, headless figure surrounded by a pale, misty light. Up to this point, the two watchmen had conducted themselves with great presence of mind but the sight of the apparition proved too much even for their iron nerves. They made a mad rush for the deck, quickly scrambled overboard into their boat, and rowed with feverish haste to shore. The following night, two other watchmen were hired, but they also ran off in terror. The next night, it was the same, and the next, and the next, until the squando earned such notoriety that it became utterly impossible to get anyone to set foot on her after dusk. She was abandoned and eventually sold, ghosts and all, to the shipbreakers. What a strangely fascinating city was old San Francisco before the last great fire and earthquake. Street upon street, terrace upon terrace of quaintly irregular buildings, and people then had time to talk. Hearing that I was interested in ghosts, the landlord of my hotel introduced me one day to Mr. Sweeney, who kept a drugstore in Market Street. The only experience I ever had with a supernatural, Mr. Sweeney told me, took place in this very store. Exactly 12 years ago, I engaged the services of a young man called Edward Marsden. He was very capable, but highly strong and sensitive. He had been with me about six months when he came into the parlor one evening with a face like a corpse. I've poisoned someone, he gasped. Poisoned someone, I exclaimed. Good God, what do you mean? He went on to say quickly, A young fellow came into the store about an hour ago and handed me a prescription. It was signed by, by Dr. Nelligan of 111th Street. I made it up and gave it to him, but I've just found out I put in salts of lemon instead of paragoric. Are you sure? I asked. Certainly, he said, the bottle of salts of lemon is on the table in the laboratory with a stopper out. I must have used it by mistake. The young man will die if he is not dead already, and I am ruined for life. We both are, I shouted at him. Ring Dr. Nelligan and ask for the man's address. When you get it, drive round to him. You might still be in time. It was no use scolding him for carelessness. He was upset enough already and blowing up just then might, I thought, cause his collapse. All we could do was to hope for the best. He ran the doctor and drove to the patient's address only to find that the young man had just left. The landlady had no idea where he had gone. To Marsden, this was the last straw. He came back in a very distressed state, trembling all over as if he had og, and after telling me what had happened, he went upstairs and slammed his door. I had the police put out an emergency call for the patient. About a quarter of an hour later, my wife, the servant girl, and I all heard Marsden so we thought, come downstairs and go out. The servant then went up to his room to make the bed, and hearing her scream out, I ran upstairs to find her standing in the middle of the floor, wringing her hands, while Marston was sitting in a chair, dead. He had been dead for some minutes. That, Mr. O'Donnell, was the beginning of the strange occurrences here. If it was not Marsden, who we all heard go out, who could it have been? There was no one in the house, but we three, and the body in the chair upstairs, so that it must have been, been Marston's ghost. Well, from that day on, we had no peace. Footsteps, which we all recognized as Marston's, for he had a peculiar lumping kind of walk, trod up and down the stairs all hours of the day and night, and frequently when I was in the laboratory mixing medicines, I was strongly conscious of some presence standing close beside me and watching everything I did. One day my wife saw him. She was going out and wanting some money she called to me. Finding me as she thought standing on the hearth rug of the parlor with my back to her, she touched me on the shoulder. The next moment she discovered her mistake. 
The person she had mistaken for me turned round and she found herself looking at the white, frightened face of Edward Marsden. She started back with a loud shriek and Marsden walked out of the room, apparently right through the servant who came running in to see what was the matter. My wife asked the maid if she had seen anything and the girl said, No, only a dark shadow seemed to fall right across me and just for a moment or so I felt very depressed. A week afterwards, Marsden was seen again, this time by my wife and the maid together. They met him on the stairs. He was quite real and solid and appeared to be under the influence of some very painful emotion as he passed by them at a great rate, so near that they felt his clothes brush against them. He disappeared into the laboratory, but on their entering it immediately afterwards there was no one there. Something of this nature, either a visual sighting of him or noises of his walking about now happened pretty well every day until one morning a young man came to the store to see me. I am the man, he said, to whom your assistant gave that mixture. I have just returned to San Francisco and heard all about it from the police. The medicine was perfectly all right. I drank it directly. I left here and it did not did me a world of good. There was not even a suspicion of poison in it. If only your assistant had told my landlady about it when he called and found I had gone, she could have given him the glass. I drank out of which he could have examined. They say his apparition has been seen several times since, not that I believe in such things as ghosts. Whether you believe in them or not, I told him, it's a fact Edward Marsden has both been seen and heard. Then I hope, he said, my visit here today will put matters to right, and that his spirit, learning I am alive and well, will find rest and trouble you no more. He then bid me good morning and walked towards the door, but stopped very suddenly. My God, he cried, there he is. I looked, and as sure as I am sitting here, Mr. O'Donnell, there was Edward Marston, just as I had known him in life, standing on the pavement with his face glued to the window, peering in at us. The expression in his eyes were one of infinite joy and astonishment. I took a step or two towards him with the intention of speaking but he immediately vanished, and from that day to this, the hauntings have entirely ceased. Oddly enough, it was also from the proprietor of a store that I learned of a haunting in New York, a particularly evil one, this. On my stay in New York, I lodged in a 50-cent hotel in West Quay, not a particularly elevating neighborhood, but one which, I was told, possessed several haunted buildings. I was taken to see one of them, a small store that supplied Siemens kits by a fellow lodger. The proprietor of the store was a Swede named Jansen. He was at first extremely reticent, but on my assuring him that I was not in touch with any of the New York newspapers and would not connive at his story getting into print, he agreed to tell me what had happened. Calling his wife, a plain, stolid-looking woman dressed in a neat and spotlessly clean print gown, Mr. Jansen led the way upstairs to the top landing. There he stopped opposite a closed door in front of which stood a large oak chest. That's the room, he said. We've barricaded it like that to prevent the children going in. When we first came here, my wife and I and our youngest child, Bertha, slept there. But we none of us liked the room and soon began to have very disturbed nights. I had bad nightmares and so had my wife. And Bertha too, Mrs. Jansen said. She used to dread being left alone in the room even for five minutes and would cry till one of us went to her. That's right enough, her husband said, and Bertha's never behaved like that since we moved her into another room. He continued, well, we experienced nothing more disturbing than bad dreams for the first fortnight or so, and nothing happened till we were both woken up one night by hearing Bertha scream in her cot. We lit a candle and got out of bed. What's the matter, I asked the child. Are you in pain? No, Papa, she said. I was frightened. I kept hearing the bed creak, and I thought one of you was coming out of it to kill me. Of course, I brushed it off as much nonsense. You've been dreaming again, child, I told her. I then said to my wife, if she has many more of these nightmares, we had better send for the doctor, don't you think so? My wife made no answer, but suddenly gave a cry and pointed to our bed. Otto, look at the clothes. We never left them like that. What's happened to them? I looked. The clothes were all heaped together down the center of the bed 
exactly in the shape of a human body, with the face turned towards us. We all three stared at it in open-mouthed silence, and the longer we gazed, the more pronounced grew its features, until they at the very last became so lifelike, so evil, that my wife and I instinctively shrank back against the child's cot and tried to hide the thing from her. My wife declared she saw it move. It did, Mrs. Jensen said emphatically. I saw it distinctly shift nearer to us. So did Bertha. I know you were both agreed on that, Mr. Jansen said. All I can say is I didn't see it move. But I started praying that whether it was the effect in my prayers or not, the clothes gradually became closed again. And after soothing Bertha, we scrambled back into bed, feeling rather ashamed we had been so frightened. The following evening after Bertha had been put to bed, we heard her scream again and ran up to find her quivering under the bedclothes. She said our bed had begun rattling, just as if we were moving in it. On turning to examine it, we found the clothes just as we had seen them on the previous night, with one of the pillows pressed and molded into the speaking likeness of a face. As I looked at it, the features became convulsed with such horrible intent that I backed against the table and upset the light. When I relit it, the thing on the bed had disappeared and the clothes were once again normal. The same night, sometime after we were in bed, I woke to find myself being roughly shaken by the shoulders. It was my wife, but perhaps I had better let her go on with the story. I shook him, Mrs. Jansen explained, because a feeling had suddenly come over me that I must kill Bertha. The very first night we slept in the room, I became obsessed with a passionate desire to see someone die. A desire that I can assure you was absolutely unspeakable to me, because I am extremely sensitive to seeing other people suffer. She is kindness itself, said Mr. Jansen. Well, Mrs. Jansen went on, the feeling became so unbearable that fearing I should actually be compelled to kill someone, I woke my husband and begged him to tie my hands together, which, after some hesitation, he did. Bertha was crying bitterly and told us she had again heard creaks in the room just as if someone were getting out of bed to murder her. That was the last time we slept in the room. I felt it was a positive danger to spend another night in it, and so we moved to the one we are sleeping in now. Has the room not been occupied since, I asked. Yes, for one night, said Mrs. Jansen. She was plainly very upset at the memory of it, but she forced herself to describe it to me. A niece of mine, Charlotte, came to stay with us, and as we had nowhere else to put her, she had to sleep there. We went to bed late last night, and I dreamed three times in succession that Charlotte was creeping downstairs with some strange weapon in her hand with which she intended killing Bertha. Bertha was then sleeping alone in the room facing ours. The third dream was so vivid that I woke from it bathed in perspiration. I told my husband, and he said, Well, that's curious, for I thought I heard someone moving about overhead. I'll go and see if anything's wrong. He opened the door and, going to the landing, discovered Charlotte tiptoeing cautiously down the stairs, holding a long, glittering pair of scissors in her hand, and with an expression on her face similar to that on the face in the bedclothes. What are you doing there? my husband demanded. And Charlotte at once dropped the scissors and began to cry. She told us that no sooner had she gotten to bed than she felt like another person. It was just as if someone else's soul had crept into her body. All her old sentiments and ideas vanished, and the maddest and most unholy ideas presented themselves in rapid succession to her mind. A blind hatred of everyone in the house possessed her, and she was seized with the most ungovernable craving to kill. For a long time she fought against this, until at last, unable to restrain herself any longer, she got out of bed and sought some weapon. Cold hands, she told us, seemed to guide her to the scissors, and armed with them she crept downstairs, just as I had seen her in my sleep, determined to butcher Bertha first, and then, if possible, my husband and myself. She pleaded our forgiveness and begged to be allowed to go home first thing in the morning. I don't feel I am responsible for my behavior, she said. I never had the slightest inclination to do anything of the sort before. I am sure it's that room. There's some sinister influence in it, and if I go back to it, I'm certain I shall do something dreadful. She spent the rest of the night on the sofa in the parlor, 
and shortly before noon returned to her parents. After that, we locked up the room and had this chest placed against the door, as you now see it. Do you know the history of the house? I asked the couple. Only that before we came here, Mrs. Jansen said, there were several sudden deaths. I don't think any of them were actually attributed to murder, though they were all due to rather unusual accidents. Originally, I think the house was an inn, kept by a woman with an unsavory reputation, and we have always wondered if the hauntings had anything to do with her. I suppose you couldn't tell whether the face formed by the bedclothes was a man or a woman's, I asked. Not perhaps by the actual features, Mrs. Jansen said, only by the expression. I can't explain how, but it was an expression which at once explained to me its sex, and that sex was not masculine. The case of the Boston ghost, the haunting of which I had personal experience, came to my notice in very direct fashion. I only stayed in Boston for two nights, and chance led me to put up at a hotel which I learned for a vague reputation for being haunted. It was in a rather poor neighborhood, at least poor for Boston, and there were few visitors indeed on the landing where I slept, only one. I spent all my first day in town sightseeing and visiting relatives whom I had never met before, and did not get back to the hotel till very late. The place was dimly lit and silent. Am I the last in? I asked the night porter, who rubbed his eyes wearily and yawned. Yes, sir, he said. The other guests have gone to bed. Two hours or more. It's close on one. What part of Ireland do you come from? I asked. County Limerick, to be sure, he replied. You could tell I was Irish? At once, I said. What were you over there? I was working on the roads, and before that, I was in the army, in the Innes killings. I asked what date, and it transpired he enlisted in that regiment when one of my uncles was a major in it, and the porter remembered him well. We were talking away and recalling episodes of the long past when I heard a familiar sliding kind of noise and broke off in the middle of a sentence. Surely that's the elevator, I exclaimed. I hope our talking has not disturbed anyone. I don't think so, sir, he said. At any rate, I shouldn't trouble myself about it. His voice sounded so strange, I thought, and there was such an odd furtive look in his eyes that I became curious, and walking across the hall, arrived on the other side just in time to see the elevator come slowly and softly down. To my astonishment, there was no one in it. How did that happen? I asked. No one called it. Had they done so, we would have seen them. I can't say, sir, the porter replied, looking very uneasy. Well, it's odd, I said. Anyway, it's chosen to come down just at the right time. And getting in, I went up. The following night, I again returned late and entered the vestibule of the hotel just as the elevator stopped. Does it come down at the same time every night? I asked the porter. Yes, sir, he muttered, every night. Why, I asked. There must be some reason. An elevator can't start off unless someone or something starts it. He was silent. I see there's some mystery attached to it, I persisted. What is it? Tell me. He was very reluctant, but saw that I would not leave him until he gave an answer. For goodness sake, don't let on, sir, he said, because the boss has forbidden any of the staff to mention it, and if he found out, I'd told you he'd sack me at once. This hotel is haunted. Several years ago, before my time, a visitor arrived late at night and was found by the day porter dead in the lift. How he died was never exactly known. It was rumored he'd either committed suicide or been murdered. It was never found out who he was or where he came from. And as he had no money on him, he was buried like a pauper. Well, sir, ever since then, that elevator has taken it into its head to set itself in motion at the same time every night. Sometimes the gates clanged just as if someone were getting in and out. At first, I used to not like it at all. You can imagine what it's like to know you're the only one about in a place like this, and then to hear the elevator suddenly coming down. However, I got used to it, and if that was all that happened, I shouldn't mind. What else does happen, I asked. I can't tell you, sir. 
Would you like a bit of exercise? I don't mind, I said. Why? Will you try the staircase then instead of the elevator? Count the stairs as you go up and note carefully when you come to the 41st. Though puzzled, I agreed to follow his instruction. The stairs were narrow and torturous, the gaslight dim, and I soon began to feel very far from my friend the porter and very much alone in the building. This feeling increased the higher I climbed until it became so unbearable I stopped. I had conscientiously counted the steps and it was at the 39th. I looked around me. High overhead was a kind of funnel formed of black funereal and apparently never-ending banisters. Below me was a similarly constructed pit. The flickering gaslight brought into play innumerable shadows. I tried to look away from them for the gambles were unpleasantly emphasized by the oppressive silence, but they fascinated me to such an extent that I was forced to watch them. And while doing so, I became suddenly aware of a presence. Something I could not see was standing on the staircase a few steps ahead, barring my way. I advanced one step and with a tremendous effort struggled onto the next one. Then the most frightful, the most overwhelming terror seized me and turning round I tore back downstairs well the porter said you've come back couldn't pass it no one has tried to do so at this time of night ever can what is it I asked him what is the horrible thing I don't know he replied no one knows the place was once a madhouse I believe and perhaps he stopped and shrugged I did not question him any further I was suddenly glad I was leaving the place next morning. Seeing as it's a choice of two evils, I told him, I'll go up in the lift. And I did.